and welcome to Hollywood Blockbusters. I'm your host, Joe Hollywood, and tonight I am joined by Imaginal's Pete. Hey, hey. Andrew Walker. Hello. Our film critic, Robert Butler, returns. Hello. And George Johnson is observing in the room over there. He'll throw in his two cents every once in a while. Well, did you hear that? It sounded like a a ghost in the room. (laughs) Where's he at? That's right. He's haunting us. Um, So, we have an interesting topic today. It's something we've never done before on uh, our movie podcast. Uh, We've had conversations in the office about it. um, And that is, you know... uh, there's always a conversation about what are some of the best movie years in history. And I know one of the first years that comes up when you talk about this is 1939, which was Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Stagecoach, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. That was a pretty great year for film buffs. Personally, my favorite year for movies is 1984, uh, 40 years ago. I graduated from high school, uh, Ghostbusters uh, was in theaters, uh, Karate Kid, Beverly Hills Cop. That was an amazing year for movies, and I think we're going to have to tackle that at some point yes, because that please. was such a great uh, yes. year. Um, but what we are going to cover tonight is another arguably great year for movies, and that is 30 years ago, 1994. We've been seeing... You know, if you're on social media, you're going to see, oh, this was the 30th anniversary of this movie and that movie. And it's kind of a big deal. It's a big milestone. So that kind of inspired us to come up with our list of favorite movies uh, from 1994. All right. You guys ready to get right into it? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I am. So number one and number two on my list are almost interchangeable. Um, They're two of my all-time favorite movies. And either one could be number one on my list. But for the purposes of this podcast, I decided to go with the movie that was just such a huge phenomenon that just made a ton of money over the long haul. And uh, I remember seeing it in theaters at least four times. And uh, it is such a a quotable movie. Here's a couple of uh, examples. Are you stupid or something? I'm as stupid as a stupid does. I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So many great quotes. Of course, we're talking about Forrest Gump. Uh, directed by Robert Zemeckis, uh, who's such an influential director. I mean, he did Back to the Future and all kinds of great movies. Uh, It was released on July 6th, 1994, so we just had the uh, 30th anniversary um, just a a week or so ago. Of course, starring Tom Hanks, who won an Oscar for his portrayal of Forrest Gump. Uh, Robin Wright, who you could uh, argue is the villain of this story. Thank you. (laughs) Thank (laughs) you. we'll, We'll talk about that. Somebody had to say it. Uh, Gary Sinise, who uh, had uh, such an incredible arc in this uh, film. And, of course, Sally Field, who at one point was playing Tom Hanks' love interest in uh, that stand-up comedy movie. And in this movie, she's playing his mother. So uh, that's great job, Hollywood. Great job doing It's called acting. <laughs> yeah, let's just say that she's a very diverse actress. Uh, of course, the movie won Best Picture. Uh, Tom Hanks won Best Actor. Zemeckis got Best Director. It won Best Adapted Screenplay. Uh, it was a phenomenon. And it sort of, I mean, it's not part of a franchise. It wasn't a remake. It wasn't a reboot. It just sort of came out of nowhere. And like I said, had legs. It just did really well over the long haul. And, you know, people have asked, what movie do you feel you most connect with? Which one really speaks to you? And I got to say, for me personally, it's Forrest Gump. There's a a lot of things that I connect to in this movie. Uh, For one thing, the relationship with Jen A, because I've gone through a few of those. Um, And uh, throughout the movie, you know, his brushes with greatness, I've experienced that. Uh, You know, I was just a stupid kid from Hamtramck, Michigan, who found myself standing next to Bill Clinton or 
uh, John Travolta or, you know, all these big names. And I'm like, how did I get here? How did I end up uh, in this situation? And seeing Forrest Gump, uh, I really related to that. I was just like this feather on a breeze, just going through life and finding myself in incredible situations. And and also, you showed your butt to Lyndon B. Johnson, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> like a lot of us do. Got shot in the butt, Doc. Yeah, I, I feel That's like right. we shouldn't be talking about showing bare asses in this room. I think all of us have stories right now. <laughs> not, not not casting any aspersions. I'm just saying. I think all of us are in the glass house right now, and all of us have stones. None That's of us right. can chuck them. So there's a lot of reasons why I love Forrest Gump. Uh, Tom Hanks is one of my all-time favorite actors. I've been following his career since uh, Bosom Buddies uh, and uh, just absolutely love this movie. So let's start with you, Nick. What what are your memories, uh, impressions of Forrest Gump? I, For me, Forrest Gump, when I saw it in the theater, I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have. I, hmm. I think it's one of those, I was 15. I'm a snot-nosed teenager. So when you, you watch <laughs> this stuff like, oh, I'm looking at the technology like, wow, they, you know, he stand, they put Tom Hanks next to John F. Kennedy. That's really well done. It's almost like a seamless blend in there. I'm admiring the technology because I'm thinking of Jurassic Park, which came out the year before. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, man, I wonder if I should go watch that action movie with Arnold later on, you know. <laughs> but when you, when you, when I watch it again at home, I saw it in theater, but when I, you know, it's still, I remember the theater, what hit me the most was when, uh, spoilers, which I shouldn't be saying to anyone it's a thirty-year-old movie, but <laughs> yeah, anyway. I think I think that rule is yeah. out the window. You're lucky I have seen this movie. <laughs> I I have no words for you. <laughs> uh, but when 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 Sally Field passes away, that moment when he comes, I'm like, "What's my destiny, Mom?" I like that that you know. Sometimes it'll just some some scenes will just hit you, but it's the score, just the way she talks. Like I was destined to be your mama, and then you know my mom will come down and say something like, "I go hug my mom." She's like, "What's this about?" I'm like, "Don't worry, Mom. I'm just <laughs> showing you affection." And yeah. then in the end, when he goes and sees the villain of the story to find that he has a child with her, <laughs> and, and everyone knows what I'm talking about, she did. Anyway, yeah, you know, she says, uh, you know, he says, is, is he smart or is he like, and he's self-aware to that point. And yeah, I, yeah. I was like, those two moments like really hit me. Yeah. Where I go, man. And then obviously when he, lo- you know, I got to find Bubba, you know, hey, yeah. Forrest. If I knew, I, I would have said something different if I knew those were the last lines. Like those things stick with me. For that mm-hmm. movie, like, and I, I appreciate the hell of it. Uh, no, I, Forrest Gump, uh, as far as 1994, in retrospect, goes under my Mount Rushmore. Wow, interesting. Yeah, for 1994, I mean, we're talking. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, my, my, no, movies of all time, I can't put great. it up there. I, I love it, but you know. Oh, see, it's on. At, it's on my all-time greatest movie list. I, I only get yeah. four spots, Joe. For God's sake, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, kick Star Wars off. What? All right. Yeah, your Mount Rushmore for 1994. I will agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I could only imagine, you know, you were talking about the, the special effects with trying to make it look like Forrest Gump is interacting with J- JFK and historical figures. And you could only imagine what they could have done if they had this deep fake technology right. that exists today. Because that's one of the one of the weaknesses of Forrest Gump is the mouths look kind of funny when they're trying to get him to say new dialogue. and uh, The John Lennon part, too. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to yeah. chime in here. But it was a big deal back then. Oh, I had, it was. There's nothing to compare it to, right? You did have the, the T2 guy that came out the, the year before, which was really cool. And you thought, wow, oh, what, yeah. what could you do with that? But it it uh, to me, I thought it was funny as heck. My, my oh, dad sure. and I sat and laughed and laughed when he's standing in the background and he's like, Holding his crotch because <laughs> yeah. he drank like eighteen Pepsi's or whatever. Uh, and he's, I, got, I got a pee. Got a pee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the way that some of those were great. It, the Lennon part was a little <laughs> bit off putting, and the, that part because that was the year that they start putting into commercials. Like they had what was the one where they had Louis Armstrong in a Coke commercial? I was like, this feels blasphemous. Yeah, and, uh, and it looks so off. Fred Astaire dancing with yeah, a coat rack. And, or and uh, what's his face? Or no, with a it was like a Swiffer or something. Yeah, like and, and the, they yeah. put the Duke in a commercial. <laughs> All right. and I went, Nah, this yeah, you know, yeah. come on, guys. This you know, make this blend a I little. I remember somebody said, "Well, what is it? Too soon?" And and then somebody replied back then. I don't remember how it went, but it was like it's always too soon. <laughs> certain people, you just can't do that. It's yeah, classic. yeah, for yeah. exploiting their images. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, it, so I I was concerned because you saw the commercial. I'm like, oh, I hope this doesn't you know don't do this in this movie. But you know, they they did a great job. Other than like Lennon, because they had more dialogue. There had to be a pause in it. For the Dick Cav- uh, Dick Cavett show, so yeah, yeah, but no, no, uh, Forrest Gump, I-, I love it, and as I get older, I appreciate it more. So yeah, if we ever do a podcast dedicated solely to tear jerkers, 
Woo, did I sob in this movie, especially when he visited Jenny's grave near the end. Oh, man, I just lost it. Now, she it. got a raw deal. I saw her <laughs> upbringing, but that didn't excuse yeah. how she treated him. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I can do a whole podcast on uh, that sort of thing where, you know, the friend versus boyfriend situation that we tend to find ourselves in. So, yeah. Andrew, what are your memories, your thoughts on Forrest Gump? I've only seen it all the way through once, um, probably 2004. Yeah, probably second year of college. I watched it with my girlfriend at the time, and she said, what, you've never seen this movie, Andrew? Kind of like you guys, every, every other week. Yeah, yeah, every, yeah. Na- na- naturally, you know, I'm used to it now. Yeah, um, we should put that on a T-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, I loved it. Of course, I loved it. Um it's a it's a it's a master class of of, of of a character study and also I I love movies that are always like a person like going on a journey whether it's like a road trip or mm. like a Wizard of Oz type of movie this movie because he's always and finds himself in different places throughout his life I love movies like that yeah um it's like my favorite like subgenre or whatever you want to call it those type of movies um and of course I love Robert Zemeckis and the vast majority of movies he's done. And like you said, Tom Hanks, he's, he's one of our, our greatest actors of all time. Yeah. And the beautiful Robin Wright. I mean, there's nothing bad about this movie. Yeah, she yeah. she had a couple of uh, uh, hits. Or, I don't even yeah. know if I would uh, I would call some of her other movies hits, but they've gone on to become classics like The Princess, Princess Bride. Bride. Yeah. Princess Bride right. wasn't necessarily a, a financial success, but now people widely regard it yes. as a, a I, classic. It's funny, when every once in a while I'll come across a young person, either in re- – like real life or online that's like in their late teens or early twenties coming across the princess bride. And they're like, this movie is amazing. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those movies that people are just going to keep finding even as the decades go by and everyone loves it. I will say yeah. one thing when they talk about young people watching that stuff right now, they, they watch Forrest Gump and they go, God, could you imagine it? Like back then it must've been like, like magic to them. I'm like, eh. They're talking to me as if like I'm some like we, we grew up as Hicks or something. I'm like you little so and so. I'm not gonna because I don't want to get us in trouble. But I'm like, oh, you watch those reactions. Like, God, it, it must have felt like magic to him. Could you imagine being at that time? It's like so brand new. Like, wow, I wish I could be them. Like you. It's like, hey, look, they didn't have toilet paper back then. God. I'm like, yeah, it's that's the backhanded comment I expect from you. We're not gonna leave a planet for you. <laughs> Robert, our resident film critic. Uh, what are your thoughts on Forrest Gump? I absolutely think it's a great film. It I just did my whole 1994 retrospective. Yes. That I do every year as I go back and I do these celebrations and I go back and watch a lot of the films from those years. I just did it with 94 earlier in the year. And at first I didn't know what to think of Forrest Gump retrospective because it's got beaten up over the years by some people. Yeah. You know, you get the snots. You yeah. know, you get the revisionists. You yeah. know, you get the online mob. What do they like yeah. to do? They like to bring down a lot of great movies. Yeah. So I went in and I'm like, is it as bad as what they're saying? I'm like, and I watched it again. I'm like, no, this is every bit as great as it was in 1994. It's a yeah. very moving and endearing film, greatly acted still, yes. still te- a technical accomplishment. Mm-hmm. I actually think uh, it's Zemeckis' greatest achievement yet, uh-huh. and I also think it's Tom Hanks' best performance. Uh-huh. And, for a, for, and for a film to have all these tonal shifts in the film, it pulls it off so well. Yes. It never feels jarring. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, some of the best movies are the ones that um, mix humor and drama and pathos. Yeah. It gives you a little bit of everything in that, you know, two or so hours that you're sitting in the theater. It has right. a little bit of everything. And a lot of people criticize it for the history, but mm-hmm. I think the history is quite great. And you can, you're in his lens to that history. You're on his journey, like Andrew said. Yeah. And even though he's kind of naive to a lot of the stuff, that's yeah. where the genuineness of the film is because he still gets to experience these American experiences through American experiences his own perspective and that's what makes it so beautifully profound you know i wanted yeah. to, i wanted to get your both your pins george and all, all you guys for people who weren't alive at the time so when they get to watch the movie he's that point of view character because exactly. he has that yeah. that naivete like he right. it's almost like watching with the, he's like wow what's going on here he's looking yeah. at the vietnam protest and he's like what's going on everybody right. like yeah. oh, you want to speak he's like okay i the war was you know and then they mute him yeah no it's yeah so you can watch it now and like it, you get you can follow through his perspective. I don't know if the Zemeckis did that on purpose. Yeah, I love when the mic goes out. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that Lost in Translation <laughs> ending, but Zemeckis was doing that before Sofia Coppola. You know the whisper, but you don't hear what he says. You know, yeah. Yeah, it was really deep, man. Yeah, <laughs> and that's all I have to say about them. Like, what did what did Forrest just say about yeah. it? 
Now, I think Forrest Gump serves the same purpose that Jack and Rose serve in Titanic, where they're fictional characters, but they're the, the vessel that we experience, in the case of Titanic, from the coal, coal shoveling rooms to the first class lounge, Jack and Rose allow us to explore the Titanic from top to bottom, stern to stem. And uh, that's what Forrest Gump does in that movie is he's the vessel that takes us to these monumental periods of history. And, and he's, you know, by, by complete chance, just winding up at all these right? amazing moments. And yeah. fortunately, Tom Hanks survived, whereas Leo was murdered by his love interest. <laughs> yeah. Another possible villain in uh, the I'll Rose never, uh, character. I'll never forgive her. <laughs> so the one thing that I really liked about it is I have a memory that's associated with it that's pretty cool. Uh, my dad said, because I was in Taiwan at the time when it came out. I was in Taiwan from 93 to 95, came back, got married, and the time that we were here... My dad said, I'm going to take you to see this movie. And I said, why? He says, well, because I think he says, I grew up with guys like Tom Hanks that were just, are like the, the character that Tom Hanks plays in this. And I said, mm-hmm. what do you mean? He says, you'll understand. So afterward, he said, I knew a guy, a lot of, my dad graduated from Harvard, got his PhD at Columbia. And so he, he, surra- he was surrounded by a lot of really bright guys. He said, but he would all, he would, he also had just, he knew a lot of people in his life that were just as wealthy and just as successful but they were complete idiots. And so the way he said it to me was it, it, it he, he doesn't really, I mean, he knows he's an idiot, but he has no idea how lucky he is. And people around him begin to rely on him. And he has a much richer life because of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah well said. And, and like I said, you know, I, I relate to the character because like I said, in my, my lifetime, I found myself in these unbelievable situations. Like I remember years ago, a friend of mine who was in a, a, all mommy rock band called the my dolls she said uh she said we're doing some filming uh in detroit at uh the uh, magic stick i think it is in detroit mm-hmm. yeah and uh she's like hey you want to just kind of come be an extra or whatever i said yeah it sounds like fun so i go down there the ladies are on stage performing there's a film crew filming them and then uh my friend comes over to me and says we're going to be shooting some scenes in the bar over here but it's not open to everybody we're just kind of hand picking people so she said, do you want to go over there? I said, yeah. So I kind of go over there. Some PA meets me, and they're trying to figure out where to put people. And they said, uh, sit here at this bar right on the end of the bar here. So I go over there. I sit at the end of the bar. I turn to my right, and Gene Simmons is sitting next to me from <laughs> Kiss. Wow. And I'm like, hey, Gene, how's it going? And they were filming an episode of Family Jewels, his reality show. And I never in a million years <laughs> thought I'd be sitting next to Gene Simmons going, so you see any movies you like lately? And he's like, yeah, I like the Transformers movie. <laughs> it's like so surreal. And that kind of stuff happens to me all the time. So that's one of the reasons I relate to Forrest Gump is I just find myself in these incredible situations that I never imagined I would Are you the guy of. getting my latte? <laughs> and if it's like, oh, uh, yeah, all right, then meet, meet us on the bus. You're going on tour with us. <laughs> that's yeah, how Joe right. ended up touring with Kiss. Yeah, like almost famous, you yeah. know. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing an article. So. Yeah, so, yeah, one of my all-time favorite movies uh, on my 100 greatest movie list. Currently, it ranks number 30. I'm thinking of bumping it up. It's really, really tough to jockey movies around on my list, but there you it go. is on there. Yeah. Now you know how I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm model 30, and it's such a great movie, right? That's what I'm talking about. Well, yeah. That's why you have to go be, by year for Mount Rushmore. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think they should make a sequel? No. Why, no. why would you do that? No. no. Why, why would like, you do that? Where, where's Forrest Gump? Robert's in the 21st sitting right century? there, too. I mean, think Leave about it. Like, he could. <laughs> yeah. He could, like. Yeah, there could be. He yeah. could have accidentally been part of, like, the January 6th insurrection. <laughs> like, he accidentally helped build the, the gallows where they put the noose and said, hey, <laughs> he Mike. He squeezed Pence. through the barricade, which left He's an like, opening for everyone what else. What are all these nice to? people doing here? <laughs> or, or, what is it? Forrest Jr. now is now a Silicon te- Tech billionaire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A lot from Mississippi and yeah. Alabama. <laughs> what I think is interesting about Forrest Gump is that when it came out, I think I believed that when you see a really, really good movie like that, it sets a new bar. It sets the new bar. And when something like that comes out, and a lot of these movies that year, 1994, they all set this kind of new bar. And it's the years that follow afterward that you go, okay, what's going to be the next big? Because they just yeah. blew the door off the. Obviously, they figured out some way of getting those those writers to to come up with better stuff. I mean, we've got to have something better. And then you have some years like we've had the last few years where it's just like, 
What <laughs> happened? Yeah, exactly. Why do we have to go back to 94 or 84 to go see Ghostbusters? The farm yeah. system is empty. Yeah, yeah. the I bar guess it's, is... And we have you got AI, a limbo under the bar. Have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have more computing power than we ever had, and we're still wind up with just garbage? Yeah, I don't yeah. get it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, no, yeah. George, George and Rob, Rob have a great point because they were talking about 94. You think about it, at one point, you had Shawshank Redemption... Pulp Fiction. We're, we're going to get there. And, 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 and Forrest Gump. Gump. Slow your roll. No, I'm just saying in one year. If, if I, I just know. Those, that's like saying, that's hey, why we're doing like, yeah, this. Yeah, 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 Jordan, incredible. LeBron, and Kobe in one year. Like, yeah, I wonder what could have happened. It's shocking to think that they all came out when you start adding them up. You're like, yeah. oh, because when they come out one right after another, like, oh, it's a pretty good year. But you don't realize how historically it, right. it is. Right. You know? and, so, and sometimes, two movies get better with age. People watch them more, and they might not. Let me tell you, you know, there are going to be movies in that list that weren't necessarily well liked at the time yeah, yeah with age you know oh yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah yeah all right let's move on to number two on my list which is number 31 on my hundred favorite movie <laughs> list right behind forrest gump uh released in october of 94 um some of the greatest dialogue i've ever seen in a movie and one of the greatest monologues i've ever seen in a movie ezekiel 25 17 the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers and you will know my name is the lord when i lay my vengeance upon thee come on man i was, I was quoting the- that as i was going on finally. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah i'm sure he was fine <laughs> Frank <laughs> Whaley was his career after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the great monologues, some of the greatest uh, scenes, uh, dialogue in, in in movie history. I mean, I could have picked uh, Royale with cheese. Uh, there's so much oh, yeah. I could have picked from that movie. The so many sleeping. quotable lines. Yeah, and just great scenes. Of course, we're talking about Pulp Fiction, directed uh, and written by Quentin Tarantino, with an amazing cast. I remember, you know, this is one of the most. Uh, vivid memories I have of sitting in a movie theater watching a film. I remember some friends of mine talked me into it. I didn't know anything about Quentin Tarantino. I hadn't seen Reservoir Dogs. And I remember sitting in the theater, and the first thing that struck me was the opening credits, going, who's in this now? (laughs) Bruce Willis, what? John Travolta, Sam Jackson? Like, it kept going on and on and on. Harvey Keitel and Christopher Walken. I'm like, this is one of the greatest ensembles I've ever seen in a film. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, it won best original screenplay. Unfortunately, it came out the same year as Forrest Gump. So lost, lost a lot of those categories. Uh, it was nominated for seven, only won uh, the one, uh, it grossed $107 million, uh, domestically on a $8.5 million budget, uh, plus $10 or $10, $10 million in marketing. And it was the first uh, Miramax movie to gross over a hundred million dollars, yeah. um, and I remember clutching the arms of my seat uh, as Tarantino manipulated us through all those scenes with the pawn shop scene and and uh, Bruce Willis's uh, character Butch like going back to his apartment to retrieve the watch when you knew that more than likely someone was going to be waiting in ambush. It's, it was just so, so manipulative. Intense. And yeah. like, I came out of there like sore out of, I, I, and it was one of the most thrilling experiences I've ever had in a movie theater. Now it's not necessarily for everybody because on my third or fourth viewing, I said to my sisters, you got to see this movie Pulp Fiction. I dragged them to the theater and they were angry at me. <laughs> At the end of it, they're like, why did you make us watch this? And I quickly realized, okay, maybe it's not for everybody. Um, but I think it's one of the greatest movies ever made, definitely on my 100 greatest movie list. And uh, the movie theater experience was so memorable to me, seeing it with my friends and uh, watching it unfold. Yeah. And one one impact that that movie had on me 
was accepting the fact that a story in a film doesn't necessarily have to be linear. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be, you know, the opening third, the middle third, and the, the end third. Um, this movie just jumped all over the place. And at first it's jarring. Like, wait, what is happening here? Why, why is Vinny still alive? What? Um, and I realized that movies can be anything. And I just applaud Tarantino for just taking that structure and turning it on its head. And I'm sure there are a lot of, you know, film professors out there going, okay, now this isn't normally how you tell a story, but it works in this case. <laughs> Uh, but it opened my eyes. It, it made me hunger for more movies that were different from the norm. Um, and it was, it was a revolution. I remember what a big deal it was when this movie yeah. came out. It changed everything from independent films and, and just storytelling and everything. Oh, it was just such a great movie theater experience. Nick, what are your memories of Pulp Fiction? I, for me, I... Didn't know much about it. A friend recommended a friend runs up like, You gotta see this movie called Pulp Fiction. You have to see it right now. I'm like, okay, hang on. Okay, let's go see it. And I sat I saw it and uh I think uh Rob had talked about this earlier and George too. Uh Tarantino had never had any official training. He learned by watching other people. So I yeah. now when I watch it in hindsight, I wonder that that non linear storytelling, I wonder if some other f- movie greats had done it in the Godard, past. for sure. Oh, there we go. Yes. So so that might have yeah. influenced him, but no, watching it, it was great. I I, I loved it, and I, and I kept thinking of the cast. I said, "Wow, Travolta can do drama." <laughs> I used to watch him like Luke who's talking, and you know, like uh, talking like he. Yeah. I hadn't see, he'd gone down a little bit, and I was yeah, like, it was so shocking that this movie was considered his comeback. Like he had kind of fallen off yeah, the just radar. Yeah, like, well, you know, doing it like a you know with uh, Christy Chris, uh, Christy Allen. Yeah, yeah. He mm-hmm. was doing like comedies and everything. I was like, okay, you know, that's John Travolta. Luke I will always remember him. talking movies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, that's where he kind of settled into. It. Then th- this happened. Yeah, and I was like, wow. And the dialogue was very different from anything I'd ever seen before. And I like how the characters. And I said, I said, is that the guy from Coming to America? The guy who held up the store? Is that Sam? J-? You know, I was like, and the guy from is that the guy from Jurassic Park who got eaten? Like, I was like, oh wow, okay, Samuel Jackson. Okay, wow, yeah, I, I love, I love these characters. Yeah. And uh, no, I had a great time when I watched it. You know, as yeah, you think think about, think about the cast now in hindsight. My God! I mean, you have Ving Rhames, Uma Thurman, yeah. Harvey Keitel. You just go on and on, like, oh my God! No, yeah. I, I, it launched Tarantino, and then it launched a bunch of people who could copy Tarantino. Oh, and so I, many that, knockoffs after that. And then I go, yeah. uh, you don't, don't copy. You know, that's, <laughs> it's weird. Find your own style, I guess. You know, Ian, yeah, I, I enjoy the hell out of it. Well, I think Tarantino's had a hard time because to me that was peaking early. Because I, I don't think anything that's come out, me personally, has has been quite as good as that. I loved a lot of his stuff. I, I probably Reservoir Dogs might be my very close next one. Yeah. But Reservoir Dog. Uh, what did I say? Did I say Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Reservoir Dogs. But then there's also. Um, I did not Inglourious like. Ba- I did not like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, but I did like Glorious Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a piece of trash. But I did, <laughs> and I didn't like. I didn't like uh, Kill Bill. But anyway, we're going down some yeah. different some rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, so, but, but I, I, I thought, I thought he peaked early. And I thought he had a lot of great ideas, um, and some of those were just little vignettes that you could show, like when Bruce Willis comes out of the basement, and he's selecting a weapon. Yeah. That not a word was spoken, and you knew yeah. what was going through his head. <laughs> you could have marched out through the door, but there yeah, was, that was, there was kind of a debt moment. to pay. And boy, I tell you what, that doesn't that there's not a day that didn't pop up that that or yeah. something from Pulp Fiction in my mind. I, and yeah. it, it's quoted often. And the thing is, I never understood. I was for, when I was watching the movie, I was like, when does the Tim Roth? When do we connect back to Tim Roth in the yeah. opening? Yeah. I was yeah, like, when does that happen? Brings everything yeah. full and circle. And finally, I'm like, oh, end. here we are. Like, oh, okay, this kind of makes sense yeah. now. Okay. And like, like uh, Robert said earlier, Zemeckis, you know, his masterpiece was Forrest Gump. This is Tarantino's masterpiece, and I've enjoyed the movies that followed. You know, I, I we could do a whole podcast on, the, on and you, Tarantino films, but nothing will ever yeah. top. Pulp Fiction, and whenever right. someone says, "What do you think was uh, Tarantino's greatest movie?" I'm like, "Are you out of your mind? Come on!" Yeah. I, I it's have a, so obvious. I have a similar, I have a similar feeling with M Night Shyamalan, Sixth Sense. Yeah, you know, like you're right off yeah, the bat, yeah, you yeah. hit it out of the park, yeah. and then I was like, "Oh, everything." And it's like <laughs> he kept trying to imitate that, and I was like, "Oh, yeah, oh. yeah." And know. this kind of goes back to the podcast we did about originality in Hollywood. 
Tarantino was inspired by movies that came before him, and he included a lot of that in Pulp Fiction. And then everyone who followed Pulp Fiction looked to Pulp Fiction for inspiration. So that's uh, that's your originality in Hollywood. I'm going to Xerox the Xerox. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. All right. This is what Xerox is. Yeah. Andrew, your memories of Pulp Fiction? Yeah, I didn't see it until, shoot, I was in Houston, probably 2009. Okay. That was the first time I saw it all the way through. When I was, I just went on a tear and started watching all of Tarantino's movies in a row. After I, I had seen uh, Inglorious Bastards in the theater, I'm like, oh, I got to go back and watch okay. the ones I haven't seen. Yeah. Um, and of course, it, it, like you guys said, it instantly was a classic in my mind. Um, yeah, that 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 opening scene with Tim Roth and um, I forgot the Honey the Bunny. Yeah. yeah, Honey yeah. Bunny. <laughs> I like that. That scene just in and of itself to open up a movie yeah. is excellent. The dialogue of them sitting at the table going back and forth. And then finally, they just sit up and, you know, say they're robbing the place, throw a gun in the air. Great way to start a movie. Yeah. Um, like you said, the movie's got, you know, a, a dozen big names in it. And yeah. Excellent, excellent movie. I had read something that as as Tarantino preps for his next film with each film that he's done, one of the very first things he does is go through like his vinyl record collection and picks tracks that he think will be good for the film. And that's that's one of the advantages of Pulp yeah. Fiction. The soundtrack, yeah. soundtrack with great. the classic songs and stuff is uh, it's it's like a character in the movie, the surf guitar and stuff like that and Chuck Berry during the dance contest. The that is such a huge part of what makes a Tarantino movie a Tarantino movie. Yep. Uh, Robert, your thoughts? You know, when I saw that film, that's the movie that actually got me into cinema was Pulp Fiction. Oh, oh very nice. Yeah, really into movies. That was the yeah. inciting yeah. event. That was, that was, yeah, very profound <laughs> The Big moment. Bang. Yeah. Uh, I was only 13 years old. I should have been <laughs> watching it. My parents actually allowed me to. The only reason why is because I was watching Siskel and Ebert a lot. I was really getting into movies. And it was kind of like for artistic purposes. And I came from like a like a kind of like a Christian family and stuff, but they're like, you know, he loves movies. He's looking at a different angle. He's not watching it for exploitation and stuff like that. But uh, that I like, was, yeah, I that like was the, the educational film. angle you took. That, I yeah. should have used that. See, <laughs> he's well ahead of his time. Me, I'm I'm trying to get fake IDs and sneak in. Yeah. He's like, I'm not. It's educational purpose. I don't care about violence. I'm, just, I'm not a rude film. like those people over there. <laughs> right. Did 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 you and your brother like stack each other on top of each other to like sneak into? No, he could walk in and go see the theater. He left me. He's like, yeah. I, I'm, I can go see it. You enjoy yourself. Yeah. Like that. I actually got to see the movie in the theater at the Kego Harbor wow. Dollar Theater. My wow. friend, my old friend Angela and I went. Her dad took us, and we all saw it. And I got permission from my mom. She's like, Yeah, that's fine. And you really want to see this movie? We walked out just dizzy <laughs> from it. Like, yeah, even I at imagine, 13, yeah. it was like it was like a whiplash. Yeah, yeah. And we, and it, it was like that summer, and it, and it came out in VHS like two months later. It took a year for that film to come on VHS. We rented it in September. And then Angela and I watched it again with her dad, and we loved it even more. And I was addicted to that film. And to this day, I, I watched it again. I could watch that movie anytime. It never gets old. Yeah. It's, it's the dialogue, the, co- the, char- the colorful characters, just yeah. the structure, just brilliant filmmaking. The, the, the wolf, Harvey Keitel, to yeah. Butch, like Bruce Willis, to the, oh, my God. Every, story, every theme yeah. in this film's got uh, uh, redemption. We're talking about somebody saving somebody from that film. So it's not just senseless violence. Yeah. There's not people just killing for no reason. There is purpose yeah there's a theme to behold in that film yep. yeah yeah that was that, that's what i love about that tarantino brings all these small ambiguities in the film where we could debate like what's in the suitcase did he really yeah, yeah. deliberately shoot him um, what was the gimp all about like do these guys <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do this what's as a hobby story yeah <laughs> is that really a security guard is he just dressed up like that to, to torture people for fantasies it's just all this <laughs> what's what's up with the bandage yeah. on his head yeah, yes. yes. and there's all this, all this yes. Uh, yes. speculation, yes. like it's front and center. Yeah. Right, right. It's like what the hell happened? <laughs> no explanation. No explanation at all. It, yeah, and, and it allows You're us. Yes. Yeah. You don't get to see everything. Though, you know? <laughs> there's. It's really a, kind of an abstract <laughs> film. Yeah. It's. It's. I'm not telling yeah. people like Mulholland Drive, David Lynch, yeah. Pulp yeah. Fiction. These are the yes. most abstract movies we've seen, yeah. and they're and and they're very well made. Yeah. yeah. The briefcase is a perfect example of a MacGuffin, like. We don't know what it is. We don't know what's in the briefcase, but it's just a device to kind of help move the story along, and it and it it's the root of so much speculation. What what's in it? What's in it? It doesn't really matter what's in it. But yeah, I yeah. tried being a, a replica prop collector. I was I found a, a, a an exact duplicate of the briefcase from the movie. I bought it online, 
And I'm like, okay, how can I replicate the glow? And apparently in the movie, there was like a large battery that was wired to a really hot light, you know? And I'm like, I don't want to do that. So I went to Home Depot. I found a, a motion activated light that you might put outside your home or something, you know, yeah. if there's something going on. So I, it was battery operated. I put some Velcro on there to hold it inside the briefcase and I painted the light orange. And so when you close it, the light eventually goes off. And then when you pop the latch and open it, that light kicks in and hits you in the face. And it, it turned out really, really cool. So you MacGyvered a, yourself a briefcase? Uh, I got <laughs> the briefcase at home. Well yeah, done. Yeah. And that's a uh, homage to the film Kiss Me Deadly in 19... 19- yeah, yeah where there's CD noir film. Even like, though that yeah, that case, device yeah. it like kills people, and it's like radioactive or something. But they right. never talk about what's in that yeah. box. It's just if you open it, you're a goner. One something. of my friends goes, "It's obviously a gold bar." I'm like, "You went through all this for a gold bar. You're not right. even thinking straight." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they, all this trouble for that. What's in that brief? And you think it's just a gold bar? No, no, come on. don't 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 cheapen the story like that. We happy. Yeah, we're well, we oh, happy. Oh no, and and, <laughs> and you know, Rob was talking about you know came out in VHS. That was the one time you hoped you didn't get the one person who loved their job at Blockbuster because you slide the it, yeah Blockbuster's the thing. Look it up, and then you <laughs> you hide the tape and like yeah I'll, I'll get Aladdin and and something else and I'll just <laughs> I just like oh yeah, well, hey Pulp Fiction uh, you got any idea on you? Damn it! <laughs> I get the one guy who who, who thinks it's his job to be a moral police officer. Ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was great. Look up VHS tapes. <laughs> you want to add one other thing? So um, the best part of that movie to me was I saw it, and I didn't see it for probably 10 years afterward. Oh, wow. And it was so shocking and so – I don't know how to explain it. Like, there's there's actually, like, the shock of the violence, but there's also the shock of those situations, and there was su- there's such uniqueness in each one of those. So many different things where, you know, the guy gets the – the, the epinephrine, I think, yeah. shot through yeah. his heart. And, and then... Uh, no, was, that, was it Uma Thurman? Yeah, yeah for Uma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She oh, the, Uma, but who gives the, it to her? Isn't Eric it... Stoltz. That's Eric Stoltz. Eric yeah. Stoltz is Even though there. he doesn't uh, actually uh, do it, does he? Who, I thought who, it was the girl. The yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like, what's going to happen? He goes, I'm kind of curious to find out myself. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm not... Uh, the day I bring I coked up, you know, I'm not going to say the word. The day you could... You know, yeah. <laughs> That's right. But I didn't see it for like 10 years, and I saw it like, I don't know, early 2000s or something like that. And I, I, I recognized that I had remembered almost everything. And it was the same thing with Forrest Gump, by the way. There's just some movies that just disappear in your brain, and yeah. you walk out, and the next day you're like, what happened? You're like, I'm not really sure. I don't really care. <laughs> but that one had these little vignettes, these yeah. little snippets of yeah. moments and each one of them was so unique and were so seemingly disjointed, but when you put the t- them together as a whole, yeah, it it all made sense. And that's so that's why the Tim Roth it, is how the characters kind of were interwoven from a vignette to vignette. Yeah. And yeah. so when they do, when they bring people back alive, and I think is the final scene in the in the in the diner. Yeah. 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 That comes back to the when they diner finally come back and everybody's alive and everything, and the the briefcase comes out. That's kind of the moment that you and, and then it's and then it's over. You kind of have to get you have to go. All right, I got to piece this together all in my head. <laughs> mm-hmm. Where the beginning, where everything happened, and what actually happened. And I don't think we ever really know. And I think that's part of the music musical yeah. beauty of it. Yes, so there it, is. it is. Yeah, yeah. The the MacGuffin. Uh, all right, I'm going to do uh, my third movie, and then we'll kind of go around the table. And the reason I wanted to bring up my third movie is it's probably ranks a lot higher on my list than maybe your list. Um, I'm, there's some masterpieces that came out in 94, but um, this one is ahead of them for me uh, for a lot of reasons. And it's number 55 on my 100 greatest movie list, uh, number three on our 90, uh, 1994. It actually came out uh, Christmas 93, but any movie that came out late 93 you, has to be included in this conversation sure. when you're talking about movies of 1994. Um, again, an incredible ensemble, uh, quotable lines, uh, one of the most historically accurate films based on actual events. Uh, a lot of historians say this is one of the most historically accurate films uh, ever made. Uh, here's a little snippet. I'm your huckleberry. Why, Johnny Ringo, you look like somebody just walked over your grave. 
Val Kilmer pretty Tombstone. much stole Tombstone, oh. even though Kurt Russell was great in it as Wyatt Earp. I, in my opinion, it's one of my favorite Kurt Russell performances. Incredible ensemble cast. Um, and, uh, you know, I was always aware of the gunfight at the OK Corral. Of course, there's that movie with uh, Kirk Douglas and uh, Burt Lancaster where the gunfight lasts like 30 minutes. In reality, it was closer to 30 seconds, and Tombstone did a nice job of depicting that. Luckily for them, they beat Wyatt Earp to the punch because a few months later, uh, Kevin Costner did Wyatt Earp. I personally think Tombstone's uh, the better of the two movies. Uh, Unfortunately, it wasn't a monster hit. Um, It did make money, but its worldwide gross was... At the time, uh, only seventy-three million, but their budget was only twenty-five million, so it did make money. But it wasn't necessarily regarded a big hit when it came out. Um, but that's one movie. If I'm at home and I see that it's playing on cable or something, I will sit down and watch it. The performances are outstanding from everybody involved, and you know the the story of vengeance after after the Cowboys, which is a negative connotation in this movie uh, after they, you know, come after the Earp family when, uh, Wh- when Wyatt puts together a posse and, and heads out uh, to take the Cowboys out that there was something so satisfying about the vengeance where he just said enough is enough and kind of wiped out the Cowboys. Now, one of the interesting things is when you read about Wyatt Earp historically, there are, factions that agree or disagree about whether or not he was the hero of this story. There's there's some historians that say, if you really dig into it, he might have been the villain in the story. But for me, Tombstone, uh, I love the story of, of Wyatt Earp and the gunfight at the OK Corral and um, Val Kilmer. He should have won an Oscar. I don't know if he was even nominated, um, but he should have won an Oscar for this performance yeah. in Tombstone. He was outstanding with that you know that sickly demeanor he had uh what did he have uh tuberculosis. To, yeah, yeah. Tubercul- tuberculosis um he was just so great in that movie and the the bond that Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday had uh oh it was just so much fun so for me personally this movie ranks a lot higher on my list than it might for the average uh film buff any any uh observations on Tombstone no, I enjoyed the movie when it came out. I, I wasn't big into westerns at the time, but I, you know, again, it was a friend said you got to go check this out, and I watched it. And only in hindsight do I get to hear stuff about the, the Hollywood shenanigans where Kevin Costner was not a fan of this, and he used his <laughs> connections to try and kind of crap on the marketing <laughs> and try and see if they could get it pulled, you know, like shifted from theaters, like pulled from theaters. And you go, wow, there's some pettiness going on back there. But <laughs> Tombstone yeah. won in the end. Like, if you just think about it. Is, is that true? I mean, I there are enough people that corro- corroborate it, that they're saying that, you know, mm-hmm. we did get messages from Kevin Costner to say, hey, uh, I want you guys to lean on the marketing of this thing, kind of like mm. like downplay Tombstone. Because his move is coming out afterwards, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. So... And that was just another one of those Hollywood phenomenons where two similar movies came out within a few months of each yeah. other. And I wasn't aware of that until, you know, well, then we get in the 90s. I'm like, wow, hey, two volcano movies. Hey, two asteroid <laughs> movies. Hey, two Mars movies. What the hell's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many times can the White House fall? Come yeah. on, man. Right. Yeah. Andrew, no. any thoughts on Tombstone? Now we get to the part of the episode, everyone, where I have not seen oh, this movie. I was just thinking about this. The only, I think the only Western from the 90s I've seen was Unforgiven. Which is a Which good one to have seen. I loved. Yeah. So I, I can't say anything about Tombstone or Wyatt Earp or any of those movies at that time, except Unforgiven. Um, so, yeah, don't have anything to say no, about don't, don't, no, Andrew, first of all, don't worry about it. The over-under was 15 minutes. You more than <laughs> I blew the way past it. <laughs> I'm going to give you a heads up, Andrew. At some point, we're going to do a podcast dedicated entirely to Western. So yes. you're going to have to get up to speed. I, I've seen more, more recents from the... 2000s and 2010s and then you know some from the 70s but and 60s but none yeah. from the 80s or 90s i don't were there were there any westerns from the 80s none that i can think of there is one called silverado which is one of my all-time favorite movies i don't know if it I'll cracked it my down. hundred uh it might be on my hundred greatest movie list but silverado again has an amazing cast 
uh, Kevin Klein, Kevin Costner, Danny Glover, Jeff Goldblum. Uh, it's it's just a right. stellar cast. But I mean, there will come a time when you have to watch Butch and Sundance. I mean, if you don't get those references, then they're going <laughs> to... Yeah, I, I can't know. protect I know, you. I know that's a yeah. classic. No, I haven't seen it. Uh... <laughs> you know, what's interesting about any genre is, like, in the case of Westerns, there comes a point where someone says, Westerns are dead. And, yeah, they're dead until a really great Western comes yeah. along. And they go, Westerns are back, baby. <laughs> I, um, yeah. That always happens. Yeah. But you need to make a good movie. It doesn't matter what the genre is. People will come out and see a good movie. Okay, so my two cents on, on the Western is like, it's like sci-fi outer space movies. The cool thing about the Western is that it's total lawlessness, right? Mm. So people still say, oh, it's not like the Wild West. And what they mean by that is... is Everyone carried you, a gun. Everybody carried a gun. You mm. kind of take the law with you. You have everybody's everybody. There's no functioning arm west of the Mississippi to ensure that people do what they say they're going to do. So your word is your bond and people learn to, to, to trust each other, those types of things. But then you also have people that are like, all right, if nobody else is going to take care of this guy, I'm going to do it myself. So you yeah. have, you have, you know, revenge and vengeance yeah. and all those frontier types of justice frontier okay. justice and you have mm-hmm. mobs and you have all kinds of things and the fact that you've got the technology of a revolver which is pretty badass right yeah. you can flip that thing around and boom 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 you have six six shots it's not that. a musket <laughs> it's not a musket yeah, yeah. so this thing you're in so much trouble sir <laughs> so so that's one of the things i like about anyway i i, I love i love the genre to your point i love the genre mm-hmm. and it's never going to go away because we're never going to have a history like that yeah. Like, do you have that kind of with Japanese feudalism and some of the Seven, yes. se- seven Samurai and stuff, like, stuff like that? Seven. Yeah. Magnificent Seven later on, which was a rip off of that. So, um, but, but I, I love the but genre. To, to follow up on that point, what I love about the Western genre is that you can take stories from other genres, like you said, Japanese, Japanese film, yes. and adapt them to the Western. And, and it just works for any genre you can do romeo and juliet as a western film if you wanted to yeah it might has happened but and, i, I and love you can western. you can marry sci-fi and western like cowboys and aliens there you go <laughs> oh, that was i mean star wars had a feeling of that early on the first half of star wars sure. had a, yep. yeah. oh yeah had a western I mean, desert desert planet, inspired by kurosawa yeah, and yeah. some of the, exactly. the only movies are inspired by kurosawa the big fortress yeah. isn't that what it's called andrew uh, fortress. hidden fortress, hidden fortress. Yeah. you you are a tarantino fan uh, hateful eight i know it's not like george said he pe- oh. he peaked early but hateful my, eight, it seems my, like... i love hateful eight my least favorite tarantino i'm with oh. andrew on this one i i love hateful eight i, I is my my my, my least fan. favorite tarantino movie i was saying what came out in group? 20 2015 2015 uh, i've only i saw it once in the theater i i wouldn't mind giving it another shot because i i know you know, you always see movies differently when you see them ten years apart or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it just left a bad taste in my mouth at the end. Um, but whatever. Yeah. Is, is, <laughs> I agree is with Django, you. A, is Django and Chain considered Chained. a western? That's a western. Sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Easy. Is yeah, it a yeah. western or a southern? I. I. It's, it's a western. To me, it's a western. western. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit of. I mean, it takes place in the south, but. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll revisit Tarantino. We could do a three-hour episode on, <laughs> on Tarantino. Tarantino. <laughs> yeah, Robert. Before we move on, uh, I want to get your uh, your review of Tombstone. Oh, I think it was I think it was very undervalued at the time, like you guys discussed. That movie actually was not celebrated until VHS. It didn't find its following until VHS. I remember vividly. I mean, it came out in '93. I didn't start hearing about that movie until like '94. I remember Blockbuster was really pushing that movie, and then it went on cable and just yep gradually found its audience over the years. I went and revisited last year during. 2023 to celebrate its 93 release because it came out in 93 in December. But you're right, though. Like, it wasn't released probably until the theaters till January and it started coming on VHS. People really found it in 94. Yeah, yeah but, exactly. But, uh, no, it's a really well-made uh, film. And uh, who, who directed that one again? Wasn't it uh, Pat, well, the director of Rambo, right? It, it's actually it's interesting you yeah. bring that up because I've read behind the scenes with the making of Tombstone and – the direct the directing on this film was a disaster and i think they went through several directors and i remember reading that kurt russell took the reins and directed large portions okay. of tombstone okay. so is he uncredited as a director he's wow. definitely uncredited but he, i knew, I knew it they was had production like, problems but it, I, yeah i didn't know that he was russell, like if, okay. if i don't take charge of this this movie's not going to get finished. production problems i wonder if that's the kevin costner effect <laughs> <laughs> and about, about this 30 years later here we are kevin costner still doing three-hour westerns yeah yeah like you brought up wyatt earp here's another one right now horizon, horizon. It's called 
They yeah. had to pull part two out of it. And yeah. then, of course, Dances but, yeah. with Wolves. And, <laughs> right. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Tombstone's oh. a very skill. Ah, my camera. Man down, Skiffling. man down. <laughs> what I love about this is that Robert is like our Wojnowski or – Ian Rappaport from NFL, like you can bring him in. <laughs> it was like Robert, we need we need you. Like, <laughs> it was a very skillfully uh, made film, and uh, Val Kilmer is extraordinary yeah. in that film. And yeah, he really was snubbed for recognition of that year. I think it's just one of his finest performances. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And you know, uh, I don't know if we've talked about this. I know we've done Oscar themed uh, episodes, but it would be interesting to go back and, and look at past Oscar ceremonies and f- correct the mistakes. And I really feel like Kilmer deserved some sort of recognition that year. He was just It wasn't even my favorite Western of that year at the time. In hindsight, uh, obviously, I have a better appreciation for Tombstone. I enjoyed Maverick. Ma- okay. <laughs> that, was, that was Mel Gibson's that was kind it was of a comedy. Fun. Yeah, because yeah. it was a comedy at the time. Western, yeah. And I ended up watching, like, because, again, another one of my friends like, you got to watch. It's Mel Gibson in a comedy, a Western comedy. I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch this. Yeah. And it has Jodie Foster. I'm like, what? Yeah, Foster. James Garner. James Garner. Well, that's that's what was cool is bringing back James Garner. He originated the role on television, yeah. and yeah. so it was cool that oh, they tied that in. Nice. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I watched that movie. I was like, yeah, this is this is it's a fun movie. You just watch him like, yeah, okay, I get it. I enjoyed it, but now obviously Tombstone I rank, I rank higher. But at the time in 1994, yeah. as a teenager, I'm like, hey, hey, Maverick, this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a, so that, that's my I'm top a three. We're like 50 minutes into the podcast. We've done my top three. We did discuss uh, Pulp Fiction. That's a lot to discuss. Well, yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. We're not just going to like just walk by Pulp Fiction. Like, yeah, then here's another movie. Yeah. And then on our on our thing over here, we have Clerks. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, who deserves credit, but you're not just going to skip by and like, and something about Shawshanking, Redemptioning something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We cram it in at the yeah. end. All right, Nick, I want to give you a chance. Have we discussed your number one film for 1994 yet a no no because let's hear it yeah i mean look forest and and uh obviously you know pulp are, are going to be up there but for me i i loved the professional leon i mean they call leon the huh. professional that one when i saw it that left an impression on me because that was the first time i saw natalie portman it was john john renault and yeah there we go and we had oh. Gary Oldman on there, and I had seen him in Dracula, so I was like, "Oh man, oh Dracula's gonna be a, another bad guy." And I was like, "Oh wow, you this guy's <laughs> he's a psychopath. I love it." <laughs> and I I enjoyed the hell out of the movie, and then you know I, it didn't get a lot of pub. I, it's one of those things I think, uh, Robert. I'd love to get your take on this. That when you saw that movie, people were like, "Oh, I don't know. It felt kind of weird. It, I, I wasn't getting it at the time. It seemed kind of like, yeah. I guess it's like your generic violence thing. But you know when you stop and you." Just watch how he took to Natalie Portman, how he kind of trained her when she took her in. When he, and I think she's like, that scene where she's standing outside, like, open the door. Yes. And I'm going, wow, she's how old? And, you know, I'm like, oh, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know? and she's like younger than me and she's she's delivering performances like that. No, I love yeah. the professional. So the one thing that we got to mention about that is that I saw that more recently and they've cut out the scene, which is, I think it should have never made it onto there but there's a scene where natalie portman gets dressed up like an older woman yeah Yeah. and they've taken that out and she talks about how painful sex will be and so forth and he's he's flattered and i i think that his reaction is is perfect but going down that road is very weird and i wonder if that may have had something to do with its reception it absolutely was because I was in the theater at the time and we're like, are we going to see a kid having a sound? I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. I watched it again too, and I have to, you know, agree with George here. I, I, I think it's problematic. I think yeah. it's a very well made movie, but that scene should should have gone on the editing floor. The editing floor, especially now. I just, especially you know the history of the filmmaker. Yeah, <clears throat> you know he did have a. He married a thirteen-year-old girl. He yeah. dated a thirteen-year-old girl. Yeah, wow. and she they eventually married. So it, it's even more troubling. To yeah, you find that out in the hindsight. I'm like, yeah. oh man. Yeah, and the way mm. he films and frames her and shoots her, it's really kind of creepy looking. <laughs> it, I, it I loved that movie when I was a kid, but watching it in my adult yeah. eyes in retrospective, yeah. Yeah. it really hurts me too because I'm like, wow, I wish he, I wish they didn't. He didn't do that with her in that film particular. Yeah. But outside of that, if you throw that out, it's still a very strong movie though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I that was one thing when I left the theater. I'm like, yeah. you know, they could have implied it rather than actually like right. show it. I'm like, if you even want to go in implication, there's, you can yeah. do that. Yeah, where, Luke Besson's the director. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. I'm gonna pull an Andrew here. I've never saw, seen it. I uh, <laughs> I sat down one night 
looking for something to watch, and it was streaming on some platform, but I'm like, I don't think I'm mentally prepared for this, so I didn't watch it. Uh, the only time, it, uh, the only reason I'm even aware of it is because, you know, when you talk Natalie Portman, they go, oh, my God, the first movie, blah, 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 blah. That's the only reason I'm even aware of it. But, yeah, I, I haven't seen The Professional. Yeah, Gary yeah. Owen's brilliant. Yeah, of course. Uh, Maniacal so performance. Really yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And then, Andrew, it's on your list? Yeah. It's on my list. Um, I agree with everything that was said. It is an excellent movie, but it is also problematic. There is no way that movie would get released today. The, right. Oh, if, I mean, it would, you, but that it, scene would be out. Obviously, that scene yeah. would be out. Yeah, that's that scene would be out, and it I think rightfully show so would be like, wow, this is this is really problematic. Yeah, <laughs> I and, think and like 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 Robert was saying, like the the gaze of the the camera on a twelve year old I don't know how old she was twelve year old Natalie Portman like it's not it, yeah. it may it makes you feel cringy and dirty. Hey, it, so. Listening yeah. to you guys describe it, um, it almost reminds me of the movie Pretty, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Pretty Baby with Brooke Shields. Yes. Where yeah. there's all kinds of problems. Or what is with it, the, the Blue Lagoon? Blue Lagoon. Yeah. Yeah. Blue Lagoon, even though they, they concealed a lot of stuff, a lot of that was implied and they used stunt doubles and stuff for that. But Pretty Baby, I, you can easily say that she was exploited. Brooke Shields yeah. was exploited. And unfortunately, I, I feel that it was her mother who uh, yes. was a big yeah. reason for her the getting exploited. The good news exploited, is uh, when you watch, when you watch, now you can just fast forward real fast. You can, you can go times three and you'll skip right past it and you know kind of blink a couple of times and you'll be fine. Well, in Pretty Baby, if you fast forward through that, it's you're going to fast forward through the entire film. because. Oh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> it. I'm, I'm talking about the professional, at least, right. for those scenes. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. just like, oh, I just keep going past it. <laughs> There's some really effective <laughs> scenes in that film. That yeah. moment where Gary Oldman goes and murders her family. It's oh, it's yeah. disturbing. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, like, be, eh. yeah. I don't know if that <laughs> sounds like but, my but, kind my, of movie. but my other one was Shawshank. I mean, that's uh, oh. I you know, when I first saw that my friends like it's a Stephen King adaptation, you gotta go see him like, Oh, is it a horror movie? He's like, No, trust me, you gotta So I sat down, you know, and I watched it and I went, Oh my god, this is and and, and I felt so bad. I was like, Is it if he doesn't make it, I'm gonna be so mad at this movie <laughs> because you've taken hey. me on this on the, are you kidding me? Should I add, add that to my list? Of have you not see? seen Shawshank? I have not seen Shawshank. Oh, Holy <laughs> moly! Wow! I'll add it. We're, we're '80s babies, Andrew. We grew up in the '90s. <laughs> I'm uh, I didn't. I didn't have. I didn't have cable till I was like 18. And that, was a, that was a big. <laughs> There's a lot of movies I did not see. That was a big cable movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? You're right. There is no floor to this. There's no floor. There's just we just keep finding, like just sub basements upon sub basements. Joe looks at me in disgust. <laughs> that one, that shocks me. But yeah. speaking of video, uh, and we mentioned earlier that some of these movies came out were considered box office bombs. This is a, a perfect example yeah. of that. It In theaters, its total gross was $16 million on a $25 million budget. So it lost money. Wow. But when they released it on video in 95, that's where it found its audience. But it's shocking to think that a movie of that caliber would be considered a box office. If not for my friend, I wouldn't have seen it in theater because it, that's yeah. true. That theater wasn't full when we when we went to see it. So I'm like, why are we? Okay, I'll watch it. And I was like, okay, you know what? You 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 credit to you on this one. Yeah. And strangely enough, on IMDb, it's the number one movie. For it's years for too. years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's you know my thing is, I always try to clarify that there's a difference. For me personally, between my favorite movies and the greatest movies ever made. Yeah. For me, my favorite movies are movies I've seen 10, 12, 20, 30, 40, 50 times in the case of Star Wars. Um, those are my favorite movies. I have to admit that Shawshank is a tough watch. I oh, mean, here's a guy who, you know, more more than likely was innocent going into prison, suffering some horrible, horrible abuses. How do you say, oh, let's watch Shawshank, everybody? I wish I could tell that's you. That's a tough one. I wish I could tell you that Andy didn't have have time with the sisters, but not all stories I have. I'm like, oh my God, Morgan, <laughs> you you became the voiceover, <laughs> the goat at that point. Yeah. But there are people who the the younger generation that do these reaction videos and they watch Shawshank, and right when it gets to Brooks's scene, they they break down. They're like, you know, they they stop their their footage and they come back like their eyes are red. They go, I couldn't. That, that, when, he go, when he goes and works at the grocery store, and then and what yeah. happens at the end, Sad, and, yeah. and yeah. they and they just hear the music, they're like, "It's not right." They're like, "Oh my god, this feels so." Because he'd never seen cars before, 
And then right. he's he's doing the voice. I was like, mm. you know, sometimes I think about getting a gun and just robbing the thing. Maybe they'll send me back home. Yeah. And when he says that kind of stuff, you know, they're like, oh, my God. And then they, they start modeling. Like, oh, my God. It makes them it makes the younger generation think. So I go, you know what? Kudos to you. Yeah. Still not going to leave a planet for you. So <laughs> do we want to continue to talk about this or do I, we? I, give I would a, like to say something. Go ahead yeah, and chime in. Yeah. Sh- Shawshank. I watched again recently in 1994. Still a powerfully made movie. I think it has still a lot of profound. Sadly, it's timeless. I hate to say yeah. that because our criminal justice system is still broken. Yeah. We yeah. still have bad prisons. We still have rehabilitation yeah. problems. But yeah, and this movie really is a call for action on that. Yeah. Meanwhile, a lot of other countries around the world have improved their incarceration, yeah. Yeah. improved rehabilitation, and he, Stephen King's heart is at the right place in this film. And yeah. just the whole exchanges between Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins and their friendship and that powerful payoff at the end is just you have to see it, Andrew. It's just yeah. it's, yeah. it's a monumental achievement. I hope the Pacific yeah. is as blue as it is in my dreams. I hope. <laughs> and I'm like, I, man, you don't stop to the end of the right. movie, do you? And the whole corruption about you know Andy being used with his IRS because yeah. uh, he's an accountant, he's yeah, CPA, yeah. and he's being used and abused by the in many different ways by the mm-hmm. the, the guard with embezzlement and stuff like that. And I, I'm and that whole scene going through the septic and all that. You just you really cringe for him. But you feel so mm-hmm. it's got a liberating effect once he gets out of there. Especially you got that iconic scene, the bird's eye view of the yes. rain coming on, which has been yeah. mimicked yes. in other movies from yeah. then. It's just yes. a great shot. Oh, sure. That is a great, you've got to yes. love that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I had to come. I love, I love the catharsis. I love the catharsis of having him go through the septic yeah. system. Or yes. the, and he's, and he's, he has, it's his, it's his final push to get through and, and, and be, well, I don't know, it's, it's not redemption because he doesn't, I, maybe himself. it's. He's got, it's like a metaphor. It's like a metaphor for yes. all the horrific vileness through there, and he has, and that rain's cleansing himself from the awful incarceration system. That's how I look at that. Well, then, is there a and line the in next... the film? He says, "He says uh, I had to go to prison to become, become a... a criminal or yeah. something like that." Yeah, yeah. And then the next scene you see, he's in this beautiful suit. He's got these beautiful shoes on. He's signing the name of the warden or whoever it is, and you're like. Hell yes! This is what I was waiting for. You know, <laughs> I don't want to ruin it too much for Andrew, but oh, yeah. I will say this: yes, yes, don't, don't worry about me. This movie's been out thirty years. Watch it yeah. with your parents. It's a, it's a really good movie. I mean, yeah. and honestly, it'd be a good mom. It's yeah. a good dad movie too. Years yeah. ago, I did a, a podcast on uh, Hollywood's greatest endings, and this has to be right up there as uh, greatest endings in oh. film history. Because that was the thing. When they said it's a Stephen King movie, I'm like, oh god, no! Don't tell me what you're going to do this en- do, do this ending for me. Exactly. And then I was like, right. Stephen. <laughs> Steven, God bless you. Well done. Yeah. Did you have your Wheaties? I mean, like, it was, yeah. was it sunny outside when you wrote this? Not all, all Stephen right. King movies are Stephen King movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Andrew, have we discussed your number one yet? Uh, it was hard for me to to pick one. I mean, oh, you could go with that one. I like that one. Which one? You know exactly what I'm talking oh. about. Uh, yeah. He, R- R- pro- Robert gets pro- it. Pro- probably um, Tim Burton's most. I mean, his his smallest movie, I guess you would say, but Ed Wood. I don't, was that ninety four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, see that on I my think list. it only had a budget of like five million. After doing Batman, Beetlejuice, Batman Returns, Nightmare yeah. Before Christmas, he's like, I'm going to step back a little bit. I'm going to keep my guy. Um, what's his name? Johnny. Johnny Depp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep Johnny in this, but uh, yeah. you know, everything else is going to be small. Um, and I think it only made like. Five million, yeah. so it it, did, you know, uh, very small. It money. did produce an Oscar winner, right? Uh, Martin Landau won yeah. best yeah. Yeah. support for, for yeah. Bella Lugosi. He's great in it. And we played, yeah, Lugosi. yeah. Lugosi. Lugosi. he played Bella really Lugosi. Lugosi. And that, yeah. And that was a big yeah. thing. Martin Landau not only got nominated, I'm like, can he put? Can he do it? Come on, man, just once, just get it for your career. Yeah. Ta-da. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and then I'll just go through real quick, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about him, but uh, just some honorable mentions: The Crow. Yes, which, the crows which, on my top ten. But yep. um, I love the the use of miniatures mm-hmm. in that, you know, for the the city and stuff. Yeah, and the budget be, uh, the budget yeah. kind of forced that. Like the the cool little T bird, which they just recently released in diecast. Um, when you see that car racing down the street, apparently it's a remote controlled yep. model. Yeah, yeah, and it's supposed to be take place in Detroit, but everyone knows that that's that's not how the cityscape of Detroit looks. Yeah, my, I mean, with the exception of. The constant fires and nonstop crime. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ernie Hudson is great in it. Um, yeah. Everyone, Brandon knows. Lee. Well, yeah. let's let's go. Since you brought it up, we need to address that. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about having these 
visceral moments in the theater. And when you know what happened to Brandon Lee, for those of you who don't, he was killed on set uh, by a prop gun. And uh, they had to debate whether or not to release this film at all. And Merrimack stepped in and said, uh, we think we can make some tweaks to it and release this film. And so they did some reshoots, did some creative editing. And in some scenes, it's kind of evident where you can tell where they got creative. But I remember sitting in the theater and it was so surreal because you're watching a movie about a character who was killed and comes back to life, played by an actor who was killed and is now this living, breathing a character on screen who was stunning and dare I say beautiful on screen. And you realize yeah. the the promise that Brandon Lee had and what might have been. And so yeah. it was a very unique, surreal experience yeah. in the movie theater. Well put. Yes. So yeah, that's on my top ten. For, to our listeners out there, uh George uh off, off microphone said, yeah, when, <laughs> when Joe said beautiful. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I recently, two nights ago, I started it again because I hadn't seen it in a long time. Uh, also, Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Hilarious. One of, my, one of my favorite comedies. Well, I want to expound on that a little bit because if anyone agrees that 1994 was a great year for movies, Jim Carrey. Jim, Jim. Carrey. The Mask. He yeah. did yeah, in Ventura. one year. Ace Ventura. The Mask, yeah. Ace Ventura, Ventura, and Dumb and Dumber yeah. all came out in one calendar year, yes. yeah. which I don't know if any other actor can lay claim to something like that. Now, of the three Jim Carrey movies on my top ten list is The Mask. That was the highest grossing movie uh, of the three that he yes. released. And he was a living, breathing special effect. And I remember reading that the filmmakers were able to shave millions off of their budget because he was able to do things with his face that they thought they were going to have to do with CGI. <laughs> yeah, he does kind of have a Gumby face. Yeah. You know, he could do whatever yeah. he wants. And yeah. if any movie was tailored to a actor's abilities and talents, The Mask was uh, just a spotlight on Jim Carrey. And yep. You're like this guy can do anything. So was that, was that Cameron Diaz's first role too? Major I, it role? was her first like major her, role, yeah, and she thing. was yeah. stunning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yes. think it was Siskel or Ebert when they were reviewing the film. They said that this this Cameron Diaz is going to go places, and they were right. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, probably the least known movie on I have my list. Uh, it's a movie with Martin Short and Charles Grodin called Clifford. <laughs> Have you seen that? I really? so Come, that's on your top ten. Joe, I saw this. I, I saw this when I was a it's like probably eleven. <laughs> yeah, you gotta come on, man. I, I, I told read, you, I was a fifteen year old. I like I love True Lies. <laughs> I love Liver. Maverick more than Tombstone. Are you not picking up a theme here? I feel like I should have finished my top ten before we now. Went now, now, in all fairness, I recently looked it up. It's rocking a hot eighteen <laughs> percent on, on, on Rotten Tomatoes. So you know, whatever. We're all out of guilty um, pleasures. That's re re recently uh, watched True Lies, which I told you guys on our text thread uh extremely fun movie yeah pretty absurd and pretty goofy i mean it's probably it might be james cameron's goofiest movie yeah. um do you guys remember in the opening scene where uh he's being chased down that mountain in the snow yeah. yeah if you if you pay attention that is not arnold oh sure and yeah. the guy's face is <laughs> like I, he's got to be wearing like a rubber mask because yeah it, the dude looks like a caveman, <laughs> more no, so than Arnold. Yeah, let's talk about True Lies. That's number four on my yeah. uh, list for 1994. It At one time, it was on my 100 greatest movie list, but it's gotten bumped since then. But I remember thinking this was one of the biggest surprises of 1994 because, again, it wasn't a sequel, it wasn't a prequel, it wasn't a reboot. It was just an original story. And, you know, at the time, Arnold just could do no wrong, but... To go in there, I was absolutely and completely blown away by that movie. The most shocking aspect of that movie was Tom Arnold being yeah. likable and uh, going, <laughs> wow, like he was pretty good a in this. Great sidekick. Yeah. Yes. I, I, before then, he was just, you know, Roseanne's husband. And now all of a sudden, he's going, you know, right alongside Arnold, like carrying his weight. And I was like, wow, that was a pleasant surprise. So, yeah, that movie was uh, not only was it a pleasant surprise, it was an enormous hit. Uh, it grossed $378 million globally on a approximately $100 million uh, budget. So it made a ton of money and just came out of nowhere. And it was just fantastic. Those are, those are big numbers, especially 30 years ago. Uh, $100 yeah. million? Yeah. 
That was the milestone back yeah, then. Now, yeah. it's, now it's a billion, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, they did have one that came close on there. It's it's the one movie that we were all kind of skipping past, but it's some little thing called Lion King. But Ah, that's on my list, too. I'm <laughs> waiting for one of you guys to bring up. I can't believe you brought up Clifford before uh, Lion King. Yeah, so, that's shameful on your I, end. I only, I only saw Lion King for the first time. In, Don't say it. In, in 2020, <laughs> seriously. Uh, wow. <laughs> just, my, my buddy Jeff I used to work with, he's like, Andrew, you've never seen Lion King. It's the best animated movie of all time. I w- <laughs> Joe had it locked and loaded, <laughs> just his with his trigger finger just itching, um, <laughs> waiting for someone. To so bring he, up. he said, "Andrew, come over to my house. We'll sit in my basement. I'll smoke a bowl. We'll we'll make some pizza, and we'll watch it." So I didn't smoke with him, but <laughs> I I really liked it. This it may, was it was really good. This may shock you, <laughs> but. Lion King is near the bottom of my favorite Disney movies. Oh. I was not a fan. I, I liked I liked the Disney movies that had come before it that had pretty much humanoid characters in it, you know, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, that sort of stuff. And when Lion King came out, I'm like, these are talking and singing animals. And I recently watched it again just to see if I was just way off on that. And upon watching it again, I'm like, I don't really care much for this movie. And I know it's probably Disney's biggest hit. I mean, it was a monster hit. It just never quite spoke to me. I think I remember we talked with Robert before on this. Did you say it was one of the first movies where Disney had a bigger cast? Because it used to be just Robin Williams and a bunch of stage people. <laughs> I think this is the one where they had James Earl Jones, Jeremy Irons. They had like oh, yeah. a full-on cast. The, the celebrity Jonathan stunt. Taylor Thomas? Yeah, yeah. What's yeah, he up right. to these days? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but... Yeah, what are your guys' thoughts on uh, Lion King since we're so, talking about it? So, the thing that I have a problem with is if you go back and you look at, at Disney's um, Disney's vault and you go back and you see all the different, the they're all pretty much white people. And they're all pretty much, um, it's kind of the same kind of story. You get Uncle Remus, which shows up, and that's, the Song of the South is not something that they're ever going to let out of their vault. So you can right. get it, you can get the pirated versions, which have all been taken from VHSs, circa late 80s or something like that. And along comes a movie that has a mostly black cast, and then you get Simba, who is uh, Matthew Broderick, isn't that right? Yeah. And it's just a giant middle finger. <laughs> because number one, they don't have the guts to, to do a Disney film that has black, live black actors. So you don't get to see, in my opinion, this is me, you don't get to see James Earl Jones. You don't get to see some of the people that that are theoretically, it's it's from Africa, it's about African things. You have some pretty great, and then you get, was it Jeremy Irons? A scar. You get a Jeremy Irons, a scar, that's cool, and you get Matthew Broderick, but. And then Whoopi Goldberg were the hyenas, which. Yeah, 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 and it's and it's fine, but boy, it would have had a much bigger impact, in my opinion, if they had finally had some lead black or African American actors yeah. in something where you could see them, and that still really hasn't happened. You got Mulan a few years later, but that's always been my major problem with it. I did like the, I do like it. I think it's wonderful, but um, it it just it it, it could have been really great and disney whooped out on it and they should have been they should have done that movie 10 years before or 20 years before they should have been at the head of the civil rights thing they never were that was were in the back seat so that's my opinion robert where do you rank lion king among disney films and just films in general well that 94 it made my runners up 94 it made my runners up i think it's an exceptional movie i think it's one of my favorite disney films i'd put it top tier disney but to George's point, I agree. I think that uh, the re- you know Barry Jenkins is doing a new Lion King movie with Simba film. This yeah, it's like a it's like a prequel sequel yeah. where they talk about uh, uh, the James Earl Jones lion Mufasa, and, uh, Mufasa as more, a young yeah, lion. It's yeah, a, more of a black driven cast, mm-hmm. African American cast, and whatnot. So they're going to be correcting all that stuff that uh, should have been done years ago. But again, know? they're doing it as a prequel. They're like, I think I know what happens to Mufasa. Right. <laughs> it's like, is he going to yeah. make it through oh, this? Yeah, I think right. he'll make it through the end of this movie. Yeah. Was it runner up to what? Shawshank? Or what was number? Was well, I had, My favorite that year was Pulp Fiction. Okay. Oh, so that was number one. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so and I had like, right. runners up was like uh, 12th, 13th place in that area. But that's a, okay. a lot of great movies that year. But I would say one movie we didn't talk about that I absolutely loved from that year was my second favorite movie that year is a documentary called Hoop Dreams. Yeah, oh, I remember oh, that. Yes. yes, 
that's a very powerful film about adversity. It's about two young uh, high school boys who go to this private school, prep school that Isaiah Thomas went to in Indiana. You know, one can't afford it. And it's really heartbreaking when his yeah. parents can't afford to go into school and he's got to go back to the Chicago inner city school to play ball. And the film just goes on this journey for four years from the freshmen to the seniors. I watched it again. Every time that movie still gets me, you cry. Even when the mom goes to yeah. school and she goes to nursing, she becomes a nurse and she, she's really there trying to fight for her son so he could graduate mm-hmm. and go to play ball in college. And you're seeing these boys go to championships and they go with injuries and they're going through all this stuff that life throws at it. And let me tell you, that it was a movie that recaptured that captures the essence of life. It really does. Hmm. It, it, powerful movie. I think it's for me. It's the greatest documentary I ever saw. And I know Siskel and Ebert. Huh. That was that was their favorite that year. But I still think Pulp Fiction's my yeah. favorite. But I put Hoop Dreams at two. Ah, interesting. Yeah, it was yeah, a huge hit at Sundance. Was. Yeah. So that, it, uh, talk about robbery. That film was not even nominated it didn't, for, yeah. for the documentaries. Now people look back wow. at that and they're like, "Wow, this movie should have won." Documentary. It's a de- defining documentary of not only the '90s. One yeah. of, the, of all time. Um, another movie uh, we didn't touch on that I absolutely love is Natural Born well, Killers. Yeah. Hmm. Very polarizing at the time. I think that movie, to this date, has a lot to say about our culture. And then as we see our culture getting darker and darker with shootings and it feels conspiracy prophetic. theories. And yes, and uh, Oliver Stone really captured the fabric of our nation hmm. in that film. And looking at it today, it's like, wow, this is timeless. This is a very profound movie. It has a lot to say about our media and how. And you talk about the depth, the depth yeah. of 1994, stuff like Natural Born Killers, yeah. you know, and we talk about Heavenly Creatures, Clerks. Yes. You know, there were, there were movies that were coming out, and you're like, wow, you know, again, the whole Mount Rushmore thing can only pick four. Yeah. Right. But. Speaking of Natural Born Killers, I saw a clip from Conan O'Brien's podcast. I think it's called Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. And he had Ted Danson and Woody Harrelson on his guest. And he said, uh, Woody, what was what's the first thing you did after Cheers? And he got, he was like, natural born killer. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, holy crap. That was a he mind He went from app. Woody yeah. Boyd to natural born killer. see killers. Woody, I'm like, what is he doing? What, <laughs> what, 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 what's happening right now? Right. I think that's like Oliver Stone's last great movie. Now, you know, Nixon's pretty great, too, but not on that level. But that movie was very divided. To this date, it's still divided. But Robert Downey Jr. is so brilliant in that film is that mm. CD journalist who does those uh, – you know, current affair type yeah. of shows. And it's, it really shows how exploitative and how sensationalistic the media is. And yes, the film is violent, but look at it now with all the films we had, like saw and all these horror movies. It, yeah. yeah. Sadly, it seems very tame now watching like, this now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's quite <laughs> crazy. And then my last film I want to discuss is Woody Allen's bullets over Broadway. Yes. Diane Weiss won best supporting actors. That is a great film right there. Yes. I watched it again. Chaz Palminteri is brilliant. Yeah. It's really a great film about the creative process. And it's about, uh, John Cusack kind of playing like his own riff on Woody Allen. He's trying to write a stage play and he gets the funding from the mob and the mob kind of muscles him to, you know, hire his girlfriend played by Jennifer Tilly, who's a horrible actress. And then meanwhile, <laughs> Ch- Chaz Palminteri is kind of like her bodyguard. And he says, this is not how people talk. This is not natural. So he kind of comes as a co-writer. He makes it better. And then John Cusack starts to have his own epiphany that he's not as a great artist like he thinks he is. It's just a greatly scripted film. So Woody, hmm. so Woody Allen, so Witty. It's just a, a brilliant film. Okay. Brilliant screenplay. And um, Ed Wood, I want to touch on that, too. Yes. That is a brilliant movie about filmmaking right there. That, yeah. that, that plays tribute to the independent filmmaker. Yeah. And even Ed Wood, he's considered one of the worst filmmakers of all time. <laughs> yeah. But that, there's that, still that beautiful scene in the movie, and it captures it. And it was actual footage. There's a moment of Martin Lando coming out in that movie, and it's actual footage. Yes. Bell, yeah, Bella Gosley comes out, and he looks at that flower. and It's a very moving scene. It's like even Ed Wood still had that moment of sincerity in humanism. Yeah, yeah. It's, I always think about when I think Ed Wood, I think about how uh, my nephew, when he was really young, we, I, you know, I was trying to introduce him to movies that I love, but then when Halloween rolled around, I'm like, I want to show you what's widely regarded as the worst movie ever made. We sat down <laughs> and watched Plan 9, and uh, it was a memorable experience. My nephew and I sat there laughing out loud, and... It, it was, it's one of those movies that it's so bad that there's entertainment value in it. Like, you know, they're in a cemetery and the grass carpet bunches up under their feet, you know, and stuff. One one cop had a gun in his hand and he's te- he's giving people directions by pointing with the gun at people. And we just laughed. And uh, so that's that's my thought of Ed Wood is if, if you haven't seen Plan 9, check it out. Yeah, and that film kind of shows the making of it. Yeah. And yeah. Even though it's considered a bad movie, there's still a profound respect to the filmmaker there because in the, the day doesn't matter if it's good or not 
the collaborations where it matters. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you get together and you see that final product, whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. There's a labor that's put into that movie. Oh, sure. There's a lot of struggle that puts into that film, and Tim Burton understands that. I think it's Burton's best film, and that wow. moment with Orson Welles at the end, played yes. by James Gandolfini, such a scene stealer. Or even Orson <laughs> Welles. Yeah, yeah, when you think Gandolfini's because, playing Orson, I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, I'm sorry. Vincent yeah, no, Dunof- Dunof- yeah, Vincent D'Onofrio's playing. Uh-oh. Orson Welles, and then he he tells him like I even struggle. He does the Orson Welles like I can't get funding, and and it's still to this date. It's still an ongoing cycle where there's filmmakers struggle to get their films made. Yeah. Brilliant artist. Yeah. Imagine linking Ed Wood to Orson Welles. That's, that's yeah. That's awesome. When you watch Bowfinger, you can't help but go back to Ed Wood oh, and sure. say, "This is the same kind of crap that must have happened <laughs> on behind the behind the thing." But the other thing is, is when you watch a really lousy movie you learn so much about filmmaking because it's almost like the op- the, the absence of oxygen. It's, yeah. You notice it right away. And poor filmmaking, if they've got poor sets, poor actors, poor lighting, poor, poor editing, editing, sound, yeah. It, 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 just, it just makes you feel even more grateful for all the time and effort and for the experience and education and, yeah. for, the, and for the discipline that goes into making movies. Yeah. And that's what that Ed Wood thing pulls out. He just has his own quirky way of doing things, and it's not necessarily – it's definitely not, quote-unquote, right. But there, you have to be respectful to the fact that somebody's, yeah. somebody is – is it, it's a heroic effort to, to pull all that together, to get all those people in the room, to get all those mm-hmm. – uh, to, to pay money for good film and have somebody say, this is a piece of trash. <laughs> and, it's yeah. – it's, yeah. okay, let me see what you got. Right. And know? then what happens? Then they say, "Yeah, I bet I could." They'll, you know, the armchair. I bet I could do that. Like, all right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. yeah, Why is the camera shaking? Yeah, because that, that's your hands <laughs> right there. Yeah, that's a, was this set in an earthquake? No. Well, then that's why you need to stand. A stand. That's right. I have uh, three more films on my list that we haven't touched on yet. I just want to throw out quickly. Uh, Grumpy old men. <laughs> uh, came out Christmas Day, uh, 93, and uh, again, word of mouth through 94, became a pretty big hit. And uh, Jack Lemon and Walter Matthau together with um, Burgess Meredith stealing every scene that he was in. Uh, it's laugh out loud funny. It's touching. Um, it was such a pleasant surprise. Like, I... At that time in my life, I didn't think I'd be sitting in a theater, you know, watching Mathau and Lemon uh, again and sitting in a theater watching that movie and having tears in my eyes from laughing. Like when uh, Lemon's character throws the fish in the back seat of the car and it's just rotting and Mathau's driving, trying to figure out what that smell is coming from. Yeah. I remember having just <laughs> tears in my eyes from that movie. And the sequel's pretty great, too. Grumpy Old Men is pretty good when they... they uh, continue the love interest stuff and Sophia, Sophia Loren Lawrence comes in and, and Margaret's in the first one. But, uh, so and that I hate was to say it, but they were both smoking. Oh, at that <laughs> age, at that age yeah. I was like, damn, you girls are smoking still. <laughs> That's right. Now here's a movie I'm surprised we haven't touched on yet. That's one of the biggest movies of 1994 and just a monster, monster hit. And, uh, and I think I have a little, happening. I have a little audio clip here. Pop quiz, hot shot. There's a bomb on a bus. Once the bus goes 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If it drops below 50, it blows up. What do you do? What do you do? Keanu Reeves, Dennis Hopper, Sandra Bullock. Speed, get ready for rush hour. (laughs) That was a career-making movie, Speed. Uh, Keanu Reeves showed that he can be a leading man in an action action flick after doing you know stoner roles and and kind of schmaltzy roles. Here he was carrying this intense intense movie. Dennis Hopper, great villain. Sandra Bullock reached the next level with Speed. Uh, monster monster hit. Uh, I had no idea that uh, L.A. had a subway uh, until I saw <laughs> saw Speed, and I'm like, why? How did the train come out from the street? Um, but come on, you can't ignore speed and, and get this on a $30 million budget. It grossed $350 million total. Wow, that nice. is a monster monster hit. So, uh, speed was a blast in the movie theater. It was a roller coaster ride. And that's 1994's popcorn. You could, you have, you have 
great films. You have independent movies. Then you have popcorn munchers like Speed, yeah. True Lies. I, I yeah. will say this. You brought up a Forrest Gump sequel. We don't want that. But I will tell you what. If they did do a Speed sequel, I guarantee you it would be great if they reunited. They did. They did but not, if they did, well, they, they did, did Speed too, but I don't yeah. think uh, no. Keanu or yeah, Sandra. Keanu said, oh. Yeah, Keanu said yeah. If they brought it back like Top Gun Maverick, just uh, sure. like they did with Twisters yeah. coming up, if they brought it with yeah. Sandra Bullock and Keanu together again, yeah. that'd be a hit. Oh, yeah. I'm surprised they haven't they're, done they're more kinda, things together. Yeah, they're yeah. kind of talking about it. Yeah, I, yeah. Don't be surprised if we see it in a, two or three years from now. The question is, yeah. how do you get them? Why are they both on, on another vehicle that's not slowing? It's like, it's happening again. It's like, oh, <laughs> come on, <laughs> man. Again. And come on, listening to that They'll clip, how much do we miss the narrator, the the, the trailer narrator? Oh, yeah. oh, I miss him. In a world. In a world. Oh, come on, man. you got to see the film In a World. Like they riff on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. with uh, Lake Bell. Yeah. I've seen it. Yes. Keanu Reeves. Sandra Bullock. That's awesome. Now, man. but Speed is another S movie I got to add to my list of films to watch. Oh, I feel like you're trolling God. us now. I, th- this wow. can't be real. I, I mean, I lie about. <laughs> I feel like now it's like I'm just going. To, I'm just doing it just to give a middle finger to everyone in this room. You know what I mentioned earlier? You know, I have these Forrest Gump moments. One of those Forrest Gump moments was when a friend of mine and I were in L.A. in 2005. Uh, we stumbled onto Sandra Bullock's movie premiere, which was uh, Miss Congeniality Two. Oh. And we're in Grauman's <laughs> Chinese Theater with Sandra and the cast watching Miss Congeniality 2. And then we found out that the very next morning she was getting her star on the Walk of Fame. So my buddy and I go back. We got our chest up against the police barricades. And we got to watch Sandra Bullock get her star on the Walk of Fame. One of the coolest things that had ever happened to me when uh, when I was in L.A. So that was that was pretty neat. Nice. Yeah, I feel I feel I like you're you're a line away from things. Steven Spielberg. Ah, oh, I never heard of him. I love his sandwiches though. <laughs> love his delis. Love his sandwiches. E. T. What is that? Yeah. Uh, all right. So we got Grumpy Old Man. We got Speed, and then we we have to discuss this movie. This is just a short little clip. Help is on the way, dear. This is Delphi. Help is on the way. It's ninety-three. It came out, well, it came out <laughs> yes. November 93, so late uh, 93. We'll allow so, it, we'll allow it. I think, I think Joe, your calendar is from November to November, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. if a, my, my argument is if a movie comes out late in the year, it's going to make the majority of its box office that following year. So We all got our own criteria. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I felt obligated to include this. I was with you until out. Christmas. Right. That's yeah. Everyone's at home for Christmas. Once you get to like November, I'm like, they have Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and Christmas. People are home to watch the movies. Uh, all right. <laughs> and then, uh, and you've all people, Joe, you know that back then, January, February, March were the dead times. Oh, sure. No one saw anything. In it. It's still yeah, January was like a dumping ground. Yeah. yeah. Some, well, that's what's so yeah. surprising that this came out it, around Thanksgiving is because fall traditionally was like the art films, the ones that they were yeah. releasing late so that it would be eligible for the Oscars. Yeah. But here you have this fun, goofy movie, which in my opinion – and, and I know you guys might argue against this, but I think it's one of Robin Williams' finest performances yes. that utilizes yeah. his improv talents and yep. everything. Now, he did great movies, you know, uh, the school one that he did. And all them, Dead Poets Society. Dead, Dead Poets yeah. Society yeah. and Patch Adams and all this stuff. Good he, morning, he did Vietnam. Gr- yeah, yeah, he did great movies, but I think this movie really showcased uh, his talents. And uh, I was just watching some clips online today when they were trying out different women makeup applications and he would go from character to character to character depending on what the makeup application was on his face and i'm like he was absolutely brilliant in this and talk about a movie that would not get made today would probably be that because yeah everything's controversial now right right (laughs) yeah but uh speaking of big hits uh on a 25 million dollar budget it grossed 441 million dollars and i'm sure a lot of that came in 1994 so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking no Thanksgiving and Christmas had a big it. deal. <laughs> yeah, because I think usually gets pulled from theaters after like four months or five months. It's well, not like, yeah, not like sure. Titanic, yeah. that horror story right. where it goes all the way through for like a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's something I miss too. Is you know in the 70s and 80s, man. If a movie was a hit, man, it was in the theaters. For, yeah, they run a it. year and. Once it was out of the first run theaters, it was in the dollar theater. Right. theater wow. So I kind of wow. miss that, that you had plenty of opportunities to see a film. Yeah. Today, man, a movie will come and go so quickly. Yeah. Like yeah. Godzilla minus one. Like, I'm like, I want to see that. And it was gone. It was out of theaters. I'm like, in come on. Yeah. 
1994 for me was also that I, as a 15 year old, I got I understood that Hollywood kind of mafia style my my innocence because I was like, oh, Flintstones. Why is this a live action movie? I don't get it. <laughs> oh, Street Fighter, Raul okay. Julia's last movie. I was like, what are you doing? This movie sucks. Yeah. And then I Double know. Dragon, like, I yeah. love this game. Why are you doing? What is Hollywood doing to me right, right. now? Then year after the Mortal Kombat disaster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, but 1994, it kind of. I was like, oh, I started something. Like, what are you guys doing? No, don't stop. Stop messing with these things. I hate you. <laughs> Ruin your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask you. Let me ask you guys a question, quick question. If you, I, I get, have you guys ever followed Freakonomics? Yeah, I read. I read the book. Okay, yeah. so Freakonomics will say the reason that these things all came together and converged here was that something way before then yes. happened, right? Yep. yep. So, if we look at this through the eyes of Freakonomics, why was 1994 such an amazing year? Is there something ten years before? Was it the end of? Was it five years after the end of the, the the uh, the Cold War? Yeah, you know, was it point. Yeah. was it was there something in the budget for filmmaking? Like, did could was there a new class of of uh, young filmmakers that came up through the ranks in the seventies and eighties? And well, I'm trying and to think, was it, was, there their... was no strike that year, right? They were they already renegotiated all the contracts by then. Nineteen ninety four. The only strike there was like the MLB strike when I remember. Yeah, no, but no. yeah, that's about the yeah. Yeah. Now, I want to throw a softball to Robert here, but let me let me. Uh, let me look this up real quick because I don't want to embarrass myself. Stargate um, came out that year too. Yes, it did. For sci-fi fans, I love that one. All right, I think this falls within your newly set rules you just established. <laughs> this movie was released December fifteenth, nineteen ninety-three, and I can't believe we haven't discussed it. Schindler's List. Oh. That's my favorite of ninety-three. So how yeah. I do my crate series if it gets a calendar year? Yeah, yeah, if it gets released in New York early by ninety-three, and that's how I do it. Okay. And, um, but I, I did see Schindler's List in 94. I saw it at the Clarkson Cinemas in, like, January. It was a cold day. My mom and I went, and, uh, yeah, that's just a great You guys great got film. McDonald's beforehand. You remember every single detail about that we, day. We actually you? got Wien Locke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On Dixie. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, we'll, yeah. we'll do our little council of NIC. We'll set the rules now. I'll, I'll negotiate anything up to December 1st. <laughs> on, on on the year before, the month before, so I All give right. you Thanksgiving, Dece- December fifteenth, uh, December thirty first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, no, I'm I'm I was saying I was in Christmas, but I'll go to December first. I'll give a full month <laughs> the last year because I was I didn't, I was I, I would have right. put Schindler's List on there. I mean, come on, Schindler's List did make all this money in ninety four. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I'm sure I saw it in ninety four, and that's one yeah. of those movies. Again, it's a great movie, but it's not on my necessarily on my favorites list because. How do you sit down and go, ah, I'm going to pop some popcorn and watch Schindler's List? Right. I remember right. shaking, like, after watching Schindler's List, like, coming out of the theater, oh. shaking, oh, yeah. because it's so disturbing. Yeah. So, did, you I mean, think, it, overall, did you think December was a fun. weird time to release that? Because an idiot like me Again, goes to see it around Christmas. Yeah. I'm like, Christmas, let's go see it. I know. Let's go yeah. see Schindler's List. I'm like, this is so depressing. Yeah. It was a very limited release in Christmas, and they opened right. it wider in January. Yeah. Exactly. That was... That, that's not something you want to watch around that time. That's another movie that starts with an S that I need to watch for the <laughs> oh first God. time. Oh, come on. I haven't seen So my wife and I were in Taiwan, I think I was telling you earlier, <laughs> and we went to that movie, and we were sitting probably third or fourth row from the back, and my wife, about halfway through, began just sobbing. Oh, my god! And the Taiwanese people were looking at us like, what the hell is going on? I think for them, they kind of knew it in the background, but they didn't understand it, like we've understood it, and it's been part of more part of our culture and lore and and hearing all about the Nazis and things like that. It was a big deal for for us to see that, but for them, it was like that. These are not our people. These are not our problems. It was kind of an interesting situation. Mm-hmm. But that is another one of those movies that. I've seen it once, and I don't want to see it again. I'm the same way. I can remember it's a great every movie, but dang it's, thing it's in tough. it. I can yeah, remember. Yeah. It, 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 I went home and had nightmares. Yeah, it's Ray Fine stands out in that movie. I'm like, Jesus, Ray. Yeah. I know, but I'm glad he did it. Yeah. He did a phenomenal job. Yeah, just and how many master. people would take that role on? My God. I know. He must have gotten hate mail. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to quote uh, Seinfeld here. You made out during Schindler's List? <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I have here in front of me, as, as we kind of wind down a little bit, I have here in front of me the domestic box office for 1994, according to Box uh, box Office Mojo. And here's one movie that we have not touched on. Touched on. Now, it came out 
in the calendar year 1994, but later in the year, uh, the Santa Claus was a monster, monster <laughs> hit. Oh, oh yeah, uh, released the November theater. 11th. So yeah, I, yeah. I saw it in the theater. I saw yeah. in the theater, and I remember being. I guess the only word I can think of is horrified that this movie killed off Santa Claus. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Like, why couldn't he have been, like, incapacitated, you know, had a cast on his leg? Tim Allen, step in, fill in for him. They Imagine taking your kid to go see a movie called The Santa Claus, and he dies in the first act. That really bothered me, but it went on to be a monster hit for Tim Allen. Uh, you touched on The Flintstones. That was the fifth uh, highest grossing movie of... 94, which kind of surprises me. Uh, the Jack Ryan uh, franchise Clear continued pre- with Harrison Ford. Clear and Present Danger it was released on August 5th. Uh, number 10 for the year, Interview with the Vampire, which yeah. uh, I didn't really care much for, but um, that was the top 10, uh, number 10 movie for 1994. And to show our diversity and uh, our, our range, we have not in, uh, excluded Four Weddings and a Funeral. See, I, we mentioned it. I, I want to discuss a couple of great international films from that year. There too. you go. Um, the Three Colors trilogy yes. is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. French film. This is a movie, mm. a movie trilogy where they're all kind of interlocked, kind of like Tarantino, blue, red, and films, white. Yeah. But they, they're all, they're all, they were all released separately. They all did very well worldwide. And the first one starred Julie Delpy. The second one, Blue. Oh, sorry, Blue was the first one. That that was Juliette Binoche, and it was about her grief. The second one was Julie Delpy, and her and she has a cat and mouse game with a with her a Polish husband and there was the last one with Arjen Jacob which is my favorite one and that's the one where she's a model and she uh, starts to befriend a retired judge who's spying on people right and she's really disgusted by it but then she comes to find out there's a side, lonely side of them they kind of bond he kind of stops doing that and it, it's a really profound movie every uh, one of those is wonderful every every one of those is well directed and I fell in love with Julie Delpy even before I saw her in before sunrise, you and I are on the same page. <laughs> She's just a wonderful actress. Yes. And who's the one in blue? Uh, it was uh, Julia Binoche. Julia Binoche. I fell in love with her. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the cinematography yeah, in that movie and in the, in the trilogy is some of the most so striking good. colors. Each one has its own color, color palette. Hmm. Like the yeah. blues have striking blues. The whites have mostly really white and gray palette. And then, you, of course, red has this beautiful red decor. And I think it's one of the most ravishing films you ever you ever see. But the three color trilogy is uh, impeccable. Hmm. Uh, one movie that placed in the top 20, which is almost forgotten today, uh, kind of surprised me when I saw it come up. It was released on June 17th of 1994, Wolf, starring Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't have any memory of ever seeing and that. You're, uh, consider yourself lucky if you have. It's shocking to me that it finished in the top 20 for the year. Yeah, that, so. that, that film was interesting. Yeah, that was a year where we interviewed the vampire. And then, two years before that, we had Bram Stoker's Dracula. And then yeah, we had yeah. The Mummy Universal was coming up in the '90s with these redoing these old monster yeah. movies. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that was like I think that was my least favorite out of all. Wolf couldn't commit. I was like, Are you doing a werewolf movie or not? Like, what are we oh, yeah. doing here? And and it, it, it took like this weird turn. It's like oh, James Spader becoming the wolf. Yeah, kinda, it, it, it didn't work there when it was Jack just being the wolf and Michelle Pfeiffer. That was a stronger story. Yeah, when you started introducing Spader and. He was the they villain. Just kinda, they just threw this, they, yeah. they threw this thing at the end. I was like, okay, now it's an action movie. Right. Like, you, you yeah. pick the tone, pick the thing. I'm like, ah, oh, no. That was. Yeah. 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 The I last, movie, uh, last movie I want to throw out is the uh, the Star Trek franchise continued in 1994. Nice. In late 1994, Star Trek Generations came out. And uh, I remember thinking it, it had a curiosity factor because it, it brought Picard and. Uh, and uh, 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 Shatner, uh, yeah, they, they they were on screen together at the same time, which had an appeal, and it's probably why it finished in the top twenty for the year. But as you look back and read reviews, it was an odd numbered Star Trek movie, which most people agree that the odd ones stink and the even ones are good. Um, and but looking back, uh, it, it critics are not kind to Star Trek Generation. It had uh, Malcolm McDowell in it as yeah. the villain, but. Uh, yeah, so, uh... Well, because it answered the question, who's the better captain? It's Kirk. Really? Because, yeah, because he needed to go get help. <laughs> That's why. He couldn't beat another uh, octogenarian on, 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 a, on a bridge. Like, I need I need help. Really? Captain Picard, he can't make it so... You have to go get a guy who was retired, lived, wow. just living living peacefully in that damn ribbon. But nope, I had to go get him. 
I see you have strong feelings on this. No, subject. no. I'm glad I brought it up. The whole sci-fi thing is like, who's better, uh, Picard or Janeway or Kirk? I'm like, look, they all have their own strong points. You can put a gun to my head, and I'm going to say Kirk. Yeah. Interesting. He's uh, He laid the groundwork. Yes. So, Well, no, it's because it's, it, it's yeah. feast or famine with Kirk. Like, we're either going to save the galaxy or we're going to blow up a star <laughs> and kill everybody. I'm like, oh, yep. <laughs> like, there's no middle ground. <laughs> So that pretty much covers everything I wanted to talk about. Any any final thoughts before we bring in our theme music? Uh, Peter Jackson's Heavenly Creatures is great. I agree with Nick on that. Check that out. Yeah. Uh, I saw that on the list, and I I don't know anything about you it. You have the Hudsucker Proxy on there. How did you see that and not some of these other movies? <laughs> did you like the Hudsucker Proxy? I, I, yeah. my lead, yeah. I, think I, I liked it. I think it's minor Coens, but some yeah. people love well, it. Yeah, yeah. and... and, and yeah, and in, in, in the in the full spectrum of Coen Brothers, it's not it's not nowhere near the, their, the, thing, the top half of their movie. But I think it's, uh, I think it's, it, it's got clever moments. It's, yeah, it it's had kind the, of clever. Tim Robbins is always great. Yes, um, it is. took that weird tone, like when he became a full on a hole and like yeah, fired yeah. Buzz and like like got got yeah, rid of him. Yeah. I was like, this is a weird shift at this point in the movie. And then all of a sudden came the magical stuff. Like it, like yeah, it's yeah. like oh, it froze time. I'm like wait, right. what? Yeah. What? There's an angel now. Like we're doing this, <laughs> and the time stops yeah. upstairs, and it's snowing and all that. Yeah, I'm like, well, what, 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 what are we doing here? I'm like, okay, I, I didn't think it was this kind of movie, but okay, I guess we're just gonna throw that in all of a sudden. That'd be like the, that'd be like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park getting like shot by the Death Star. Like, hey, this is what's gonna happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think we're gonna wind things down here. That was a fun conversation. We gotta do that more often. Uh, like yeah. I said, I really want to tackle 1984 at some yes, point, maybe please. in a month or so. 99, yeah. um, we got to do 99. 99, yeah, yeah. yeah. 99. So, yeah, and maybe we can do a podcast to argue what was the greatest year for movies of all time. So, on also, that what, note, we, we each pick a year and then we have to defend it. Like you have to pick a year <laughs> and give your reasons why it's the greatest year for movies. Oh yeah. wow. So, all right, guys, that was fun. Uh, Thanks for being here, and thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on Hollywood Blockbusters. Good night, everybody. Come to the movies, watch Charlie Chaplin, and put some sunshine into your day. Forget the hard times. Come to the movies and try to laugh your troubles away.